And your host today is Daniel Weinberg of Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Bjorn. Thank you so much. Well, we're in the broad, I'm in the broadcast studio uh, of the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop. And uh, David has been here. This is the third time you're with us, David. Correct, correct. And the second time you were actually here in the shop and then the pandemic took over. But nonetheless, uh, we'll get you back sometime when you're here in Chicago because you come for the University of Chicago here and there. So That's let correct. me introduce who you are to those who don't know. As I said, the third time you're here, you're co-founder and co-executive chairman of the equity firm, the Carlisle Group. Chairman of the board of the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Smithsonian Institution, Council of Foreign Relations, National Gallery of Art, the National Constitution Center, and University of Chicago Board. He's also a graduate of its law school, by the way. He's a host on Bloomberg TV and PBS uh, of his show, The David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations. And that's where one of our books comes from today. He's also a collector of American historical printed artifacts and a curator and educational philanthropist of the same. He's a past author of How to Invest, The American Experiment, How to Lead, and The American Story. The two books that we are going to be speaking to you about, usually we only have one per author, but this time we have two because uh, David is an overachiever and got two of them out. So one of them is The Highest Calling, Conversations on the American Presidency. So Simon & Schuster, 472 pages. And actually, it's really about the need to vote and its import through conversations with both real presidents and also uh, historians who write about them. The other book is going to be, I wasn't prepared to show this yet, but here it is. It's really in back of me. I'll just show it to you there. You can see it right in back of me here. And it's called Abraham Lincoln, His Life in Print. Is part of the Grow Your Club exhibit that David has put up in New York. Uh, it has 271 pages and is sumptuously illustrated, as we'll show. Uh, and this also has a mission, and we'll talk about that, to stimulate a curiosity to learn history. But we're first going to start with the, um, the uh, questions for the highest calling. Now, it may, may seem obvious, uh, David, but why that title? Well, uh, for many years in the private equity world, I used to say tongue in cheek that the highest calling of mankind was private equity. Uh, obviously, it isn't the highest calling, though it's not a bad calling. Um, but I, as I was thinking about this title for this book, I thought, what is it about the American presidency that makes it so important? Well, it's the most significant job in the world. And ever since Woodrow Wilson went into Paris uh, to help solve the end of World War I, and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Parisians uh, came into the streets to cheer him, it's been evident to people all over the world that whoever is president of the United States, with rare exception, is the most important person in the world. And obviously, since World War II, when the United States has become such a dominant economic and military power, uh, whoever is president of the United States is the person that I think most people in the world think is the most important person in the world. Obviously, people in China might say the president of China is the most important person in the world. But I, I think most people in the Western world certainly would say that whoever is president of the United States is the most powerful person in the world. And to be the president of the United States, it's a high calling, the highest calling. Because when you are president of the United States, you have more power than anybody on the face of the earth to do more good or do more bad. Mm, true. Uh, I have many, many questions. I can't get to all of them. Usually we have a full hour for one book. Here we have about a half an hour for two books, uh, for one book each. So I want to just give the viewers a little taste of what's in there. You're going to have to go and get the book and read it because each of these books are well worth your time. Now, you spoke to many, interviewed a number of living presidents, uh, and you've teased out some very basic facts about them. What connectivity did you find by interviewing so many presidents? What commonality did you find amongst them? Well, I interviewed for the book uh, these living presidents, uh, George Bush, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, Joe Biden, and Donald Trump. 
Um, I uh, had a chapter on Barack Obama. I did not, for this book, have a chance to interview him, though I have interviewed him uh, previously. Um, what they all have in common is that they uh, were ambitious enough to want to be president of the United States. They came from different backgrounds. I think it's fair to say that, that uh, with the exception of Bill Clinton, no, no bar person who has been president in the 20th century or 21st century would have been predicted to be president when he was a young man. Uh, Bill Clinton was a, was a student leader, Rhodes Scholar, and so forth. But the other people who became president in the 20th century and 21st century were never thought to be likely to be president when they were younger. So they obviously had a certain drive, ambition, and a certain skill set that enabled them to get to the top office in the world. Well, one has to have uh, competitiveness, drive, ambition in any field, actually, uh, to achieve the highest political post in the land, certainly. Um, and some have said, oh, gosh, this politician or that politician is too ambitious. Well, they need to be, I think. And you're, you're correct on that. But you also asked a question in your book. Why why would anyone want to become president? Why would you want to, you know, with the pitfalls that have happened to many of the presidents right. in the recent past, and you write about them, uh, why would anyone want that job? Well, there's no doubt that uh, people are ambitious in life and their own individual sectors that they might be pursuing. People want to be the top of a university if they're a professor or the top of a, a business uh, CEO if they're in the business. But presidents have a complicated life. Think about this. As I try to say in the book, John Kennedy, elected in 1960, was assassinated. Lyndon Johnson, his successor, was driven out of office. Richard Nixon was forced to resign. Gerald Ford couldn't get reelected. My boss, Jimmy Carter, couldn't get reelected. Uh, then uh, Ronald Reagan was almost assassinated and then had an Iran-Contra scandal that almost ruined his presidency. He was followed by George Herbert Walker Bush, who couldn't get reelected. And then, you know, we've, we've gone on for, uh, to Bill Clinton, who uh, had an impeachment as well. So many people who get this job think it's going to be great. And they look forward to it and they spend two years of their life trying to get the job. And then when they get it, they realize it's not so great because you can often you know, result in an, an assassination, an assassination attempt. And, uh, and, and you're very rarely do your rep, does your reputation emerge better. And as I try to say in the book, in the 20th century and the 21st century, uh, there are very few people who serve two terms and emerge with a reputation better than it was when they went in. Uh, and I'd say since post-World War II, probably Dwight Eisenhower is the person who came in with a good reputation and left with a good reputation. Uh, Barack Obama, I think, is probably in that category as well. He had not as well-known a reputation when he became president, but his reputation, I think, got better in most parts of the, the political world. And But he emerged without any scandals after t uh, two terms. But other than those two, it's hard to think of who post-World War II has emerged with a better reputation than they went into the job with. Well, you speak of the uh, direct involvement of politics. You were in politics for a short time. Very briefly, uh, tell us of your experience in the Carter administration and how did that give you insights into the paths you would follow in these interviews with both historians and the presidents themselves? Well, as a young man, I worked in the campaign for Jimmy Carter. My boss became the Carter's domestic advisor, a man named Stuart Eisenstadt, and I was his deputy. So at the age of 27, three years out of the University of Chicago Law School, I was the deputy domestic policy advisor to the president of the United States, which was a job I obviously wasn't qualified for. And I really didn't even know Carter. But I spent four years at the White House. I wasn't married at the time, had no children. And I just basically worked around the clock. I loved it. And I came up with a real love for the presidency and a knowledge and try to thirst for knowledge about the presidency. And that maybe led me to do things like kind of uh, fix monuments to presidents, fix memorials to presidents, make them updated, or or, or, or uh, collect documents relating to the presidents. And uh, one of the ones we might talk about later is the Lincoln Memorial, which I've been involved as the lead donor to kind of fix the Lincoln Memorial, which hopefully will be ready by uh, the bicent the quin the semi quincentennial, two hundred fiftieth yes. anniversary. Yes, that's that'll be coming right up. I hope I make it at age eighty. It's iffy. <laughs> but, 80, um, 80, 80. Well, you're too young to be president, but you certainly could be, <laughs> uh, you could do that job, right? But I wasn't foreign born, so I have a chance. Uh, tell us about the diversity of the presidents that you've uh, appeared with. Uh, of course, except for this, the first six, 
there was quite a diversity. Was that a strength for our nation, the diversity of the men that became president? They had different backgrounds. Uh, Donald Trump's the only person ever been president without any government background at all. He'd never served in the military and he never was in government before. But generally, uh, presidents are people who have served in the military and or in government in some way or, or another. But that they became president is often unpredictable despite their, their background. So the most amazing, while well, you could say Donald Trump is the most amazing because he had no government background at all and was a businessman. But think about Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant was selling firewood on the streets of St. Louis in 1860. Eight years later, he's president of the United States, going from selling firewood to earn a living to being president of the United States in eight years. Amazing. Or Abraham Lincoln himself. Abraham Lincoln, as we all know, only served two years in Congress. Um, he had no uh, big national experience or reputation. 1860, he gets the nomination and then becomes our greatest president, uh, uh, you know, over the ensuing five years. Because you brought up Grant, I want to ask you this question. I've asked others, and I, I'd love to hear your answer. Do you see any like any problems that uh, the diff or say the differences between a general, a military man becoming a politician as president versus a politician having to become commander in chief? Well, a a person who's a general has a very systematic way of doing things, typically very orderly, very much a chain of command kind of thing. And that's what I think uh, Grant was, a chain of command kind of person. So was Dwight D. Eisenhower and other people like George Washington, uh, very much in an orderly kind of way of proceeding things and doing things. Whereas those people come up in the political world, which is more hurly-burly and less organized, probably are are more willing to make changes or do things outside the normal system. So yeah, being a military person does give you a different perspective on how to do things, no doubt about it. In the interviews that are in this book, there's a, a fun book to go through. There's a lot there, especially also with the historians being, acting almost as Greek choruses to the interviews of the presidents. Was there, you've probably been asked this question before, but of the, these presidents, were there a time or two that surprised you what you heard? Oh, sure. Um, many president, many stories about presidents surprised me. Um, one of the ones that you would know very well is uh, dealing with Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, as you probably remember, uh, during the end of the Civil War, uh, Grant and Lincoln were touring uh, Northern Virginia with their spouses, and another general had his spouse there. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln was very upset that President Lincoln was talking to a young wife of one of the generals. And uh, Mrs. Grant saw this and saw how Mrs. Lincoln could be so difficult to deal with. And she swore that she never wanted to deal with her. So when a couple days later, President Lincoln invited Grant to come to see our American cousin at Ford's Theater, Mrs. Grant said, no way do I want to be around that woman. So they made an excuse that they had to go visit their son in New Jersey, which they did. And then uh, as a result, the military entourage that uh, that Grant traveled with was not present when John Wilkes Booth sneaked in, snuck into the booth. So had Grant been there, uh, we probably would have had a different outcome. As you know, uh, Lincoln only had one aide and an aide's wife with him when he went to see our American cousin. Yeah, you know, interestingly, I I've always grappled with that too. But John Wilkes Booth was a known entity. It wasn't John Doe coming in? It was John Wilkes Booth. He had run of that theater. And I think maybe even a military man standing guard outside the, the box Lincoln, the Lincoln group was in, may have just let him in because it was Booth. That would be an interesting thing to have happened. But Parker, who was there and went next door for a drink, did leave someone at the door. But again, it was Booth and let him in. Let me ask yes. you about uh, some of the, uh, speech, uh, the speeches that they give. Uh, we're going to have... Doris Kearns Goodwin here on Tuesday uh, with her book, especially the one on her husband, Richard Goodwin, who's a speechwriter, as you know, for Kennedy and others. Now, Lincoln wrote his own speeches, but had Secretary of State Seward and others sometimes look over what he had done. And then sometimes Lincoln would change a phrase or two that entered into verbal immortality. Uh, but in your discussion with Franklin Foer, uh, who bi was a biographer of Biden. You state that presidents don't write their own speeches. Well, actually, Biden got into trouble, didn't he, in 1972 
uh, with a plagiarism problem. He said he didn't write that speech. But did most of the interviewers, interviewees, presidents that you uh, spoke with write their own speeches or did they really uh, give it over to someone else? Well, presidents didn't have speechwriters for most of their uh the, the time of the presidency, though George Washington was not a famously uh, good writer and he was not an educated person. So he did have his farewell address written by a combination of Madison and uh, Hamilton. Um, and, you know, that wasn't uncommon for Washington to do that. But most presidents would write their own speeches. Uh, Woodrow Wilson may have been the best writer up until Barack Obama as a president, and he wrote his speeches. But FDR did not write his famous inaugural address. It was written by Raymond Moley, professor at Columbia. But FDR at the time was not considered intellectual genius, and so he wanted to make people think he did write it. And so he actually took the speech that Moley had written and that he delivered, and he wrote it out in his own handwriting. John Kennedy knew that, and John Kennedy had a little trick. He showed Hugh Sidey the speech that he was going to give in a couple of days at the inaugural address in 1961. Hugh Sidey was saying to himself, my God, he's showing me the speech that's in his handwriting, and it's three days to go before the inauguration. Why isn't the speech ready? And it turned out that there was a trick really to convince society that that Kennedy had written the speech because Kennedy was considered to be not that intellectually gifted. And therefore, people thought he was might be light intellectually. And therefore, uh, Kennedy wanted to show people he actually written the speech. He wor did work on the speech, but Sorensen really wrote the speech, his speechwriter. Um, I think today you would be shocked if, any, if, if a president wrote uh, gave a speech that he had written today because the presidents are so busy. And we, we farm things out and we have professional speechwriters. Speechwriters write things. In Lincoln's case, he wrote his speeches. You're correct. He did show some things to people in his cabinet, people he trusted. But he didn't have any speechwriters who wrote the Gettysburg Address. That was basically him. It was. We were speaking to David Rubenstein about the highest calling, which are conversations with presidents and with historians uh, who wrote about those presidents. Um, it, let me ask you about media and your and the presidents. I I just put a quick list here. Washington used pamphleteering that was very large in the Revolution. In fact, Lincoln had the telegraph. Uh, FDR brought in the radio. Obama had social media. So speak to please the leaders and how they embrace new technology and who was good at it and who failed. I know Jefferson Davis, who I don't consider a president of any part of the United States, he should have known better and used the telegraph, but didn't. Well, Lincoln's case, uh, he, in effect, um, had uh, a, a way of communicating um, through email, but it was through the telegraph, in effect. He would get messages uh, to a special place near the White House. He would go over there each night to see what the generals were saying, and they would send out in Morse code the the. Uh, the, the, the telegrams, and he would send back the message in, 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 in kind of Morse code as well. So um, he used that form. Uh, President uh, uh, FDR, FDR basically used radio a great deal uh, when he was president to communicate, and people listened to his, uh, his fireside chats and so forth. Uh, president Kennedy uh, really perfected the use of television. Uh, he was in the television age, but he was very good at it. Television was around under Dwight Eisenhower, but he wasn't as skilled at it. Kennedy was young, intelligent, and he would hold a press conference every other week where he would answer questions unscripted, and he was very good at that. Uh, Pro President Barack Obama uh, dealt with a world where we had social media, and now, of course, we have social media to the nth degree. So mm -hmm. it's a, a different situation. When I work in the White House for President Carter, we really only focused on the evening news shows, CBS, NBC, and, and, uh, and ABC each night. They were 15 minutes. 15 minutes. That was it, the evening news. And then you had two papers you were worried about, the New York Times and the and the uh, Washington Post. That was pretty much it, maybe the Wall Street Journal a bit. But basically, it wasn't a 24-hour-a-day news cycle. It's completely different now. Your president can never really get escape uh, social media or the, term, the, 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 the way the press is operating 24 hours a day. It's just completely different. What's your thought on ranking of presidents? It seems to be an obsession these days. Uh, does it serve a useful purpose? I, for this book, I commissioned a study on uh, presidents. I didn't ultimately put it in the book because it didn't prove to be that useful. It, you know, The same survey would say the best president of the United States was Donald Trump and the worst president of the United States was Donald Trump. So you're really getting uh, 
people to just tell you what their political views were. Uh, there have been, since Arthur Schlesinger Sr. began an effort to rank presidents, there have been periodic efforts to do it. Uh, I would say, uh, as I say when I make a speech, when people ask me who's, your, my, who's my view of the best president, there's nobody even close to Lincoln because Lincoln um, held the union together when it wasn't obviously uh, a popular to do so, not in the North or the South. Secondly, he won the Civil War. He freed the slaves. He gave the Gettysburg Address. He gave the second inaugural address, and he exhibited humility. Um, humility is a virtue, in my view. Not all presidents have that. But he didn't go around the White House saying, you know, I just won the Civil War, or I just gave the Gettysburg Address. Aren't I great? That wasn't Lincoln. And so I admire him. He's by far our greatest president. Also, he had spine. Uh, that he, uh, he, he, as president-elect, many in his own party were asking him to come off the uh, no nationalization of slavery. Yet he had spine. I think to me, that's the most important thing he ever did. Stay the course in that. He did. But remember, in his first inaugural address, he supported a constitutional amendment, which would have uh, made it clear that slavery was part of our, our law of the land. His view was the Constitution said slavery could stay in the original states, and he supported that. Uh, in his in his first inaugural address, obviously he changed his mind over the view over the years. He was not he was not an abolitionist. He was basically a person who didn't believe we should have slavery in the new states, and that was what led to the Civil War. Because in the end, the, the, even though Lincoln said, "I'm not going to get rid of slavery in the existing states," people believed that if we didn't have slavery in the new states, ultimately the new states would outweigh in rank and, and in popularity and, and and congressional influence the the slave states, and eventually slavery would would be outlawed. That was the view, and that's why uh, the South seceded, in my view. Interestingly, yes, right? I was yeah, going to say that. That Lincoln is a is a kind of example of uh, many of our former presidents at that age. We don't have any interviews of them. The interview format that we're now engaging in did not really exist then. And so if you say, I want to look up an interview with Abraham Lincoln, it doesn't exist, or George Washington. I thought with artificial intelligence, maybe someday we can yeah. do an interview of, of Lincoln and somebody can say, here's what Lincoln would have said. But right now we don't have any interviews of Lincoln. Well, of course, interviews mean that there are interviewers who ask maybe difficult questions. I was thinking as you were saying this, how maybe memoirs, I was thinking of Grant's memoirs as an example, or even uh, Eisenhower's crusade in Europe are could be in a way uh, interviews uh, that they showing what they want us later to know and think and feel. That's what I think I miss most about the assassination of Lincoln. His memoir would have been wonderful. Yes. And the amazing thing about memoirs is that, um, you know, some presidents write them and some really have ghostwriters. Um, to be honest, in recent years, very few presidents are writing these books by themselves. Um, but the best person who wrote the, a memoir by himself is a person named Ulysses S. Grant. He wrote a memoir which he finished just before he died about his civil war experience, not about his presidency. And it was considered widely the best presidential memoir ever written because it was honest, factual, and, and easy to read. Yes, true. Um, what about leadership? What traits did you find in the interviews that you did? And maybe was there any difference what the historians felt from what the presidents might have said about leadership in the presidency? Well, uh, to be a leader, you have to have uh, you have to know where you're taking people. So you have to have a view of where you want to go, but you have to be effective in getting people to follow you. If you're going to be a good leader, you have to have followers, and you do that as a president by making good speeches. You know, Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address or the Second Inaugural Address. You get an incredible speech, or John Kennedy's Inaugural Address, or uh, FDR's Inaugural Address. You make a speech, or you um, you write something that is compelling. And, and people will listen to it or read it. But also, leading by example, doing what you tell people to do is a great way to be a leader. But presidents have to have very good communication skills because in the end, all of life is about persuading somebody to do what you want. And you have to have really good communication skills if you're president of the United States and try to persuade people to do what you want. As you mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, none of those people felt, the, the interviews that you did with the presidents felt that they would be president. Although that's the highest ambition of any person in any field, and that's the highest place to go. So 
Some must have harbored in the back, maybe, but I doubt any of them felt that they were ready for it. Uh, well, how are we voters to discern who might be ready to be president? Of course, uh, you know, people don't like either candidate sometimes. So take uh, John Kenny. He ran when he was 43. Uh, Richard Nixon was 47. They're both very young. Uh, Nixon obviously had more experience, but Kennedy had to convince people he was smart enough and healthy enough uh, to be president and overcome the prejudice against people who are Catholic, for example. Um, I'd say uh, of the, all the people who have been president of the United States, the one who probably spent the most time thinking about and trying to be president who got there was Joe Biden. He mm -hmm. was elected to the Senate in 1972 at the age of 29 and a half, inaugur inaugurated as a senator or sworn in as, at the age of 30. And um, he then was thought to be a potential presidential candidate from the time he was 30 until the time he was elected at the age of 78. So for 48 years, 48 years, he had to deal with, is he going to be president? He's not going to be president. Does he want to be president? Most pe people don't spend that much time thinking about it, and they're not in the public eye that, that much. And the people who had the shortest tenure that probably be potential presidential candidates, aside from some who were, were vice president and never really thought they'd be president, but the, because of an assassination, they became president. Where Donald Trump, he might have thought about being president, but never taken seriously by political people until he ran the first time and got and got the nomination. And secondly, um, I would say uh, Barack Obama. Barack Obama grew up as a um, half black, half white person in Hawaii without any wealth and was not a particularly famous scholar or athlete. Yet who would have thought, and he must not have thought, he'd ever be president of the United States, get selected to the Senate, and within two years he's running for president. Who would have thought that? Uh, you know, part of this book is also civics and giving an incentive to vote and also political science is a political science aspect to this, David, Cer certainly the end where you you uh, ponder some changes that are not going to happen with uh, the Constitution because it's so difficult to change the Constitution, but you give some uh, changes that are doable also in the past, in the future. Yes. Uh, yes. What civics and what political science might you say people will find in this book? Well, I, in the civics-related thing, I, I try to urge people to vote. We had last presidential election, we had 160 million people vote, but we had 80 million people who were eligible to vote, 80 million who did not vote. And I think maybe our governments would have greater support if they had more people voting for the people that are in power. In terms of changes, yes, the Electoral College it has all the anti-democratic features we know about. It's not going to change. It requires a constitutional amendment. It's not going to happen. Uh, getting money out of politics would be wonderful. Uh, but this this election will probably spend $8 billion, if not $9 billion on the election. I think that'd be great to get rid of it. But because of Supreme Court rulings, we can't do that. So things that are more manageable, don't require a constitutional amendment, are things like this. Disclosing your health when you're a candidate or a, or a president. Right now, there's no requirement to disclose your health, and you get letters that don't really tell you very much coming from somebody's doctor, and they're not really independent. And so you don't really know what the health is of a person before the person gets elected or when the person is president. Uh, next is we don't require presidents to have, stay out of, of making money. Uh, right now, there's no requirement that there be a blind trust, no requirement that anybody refrain if it's president of the United States from trying to make money. I think it'd be good if we had some restraints on that, but we don't have them now. Um, those would be two changes that I think would be be very good. Uh, I also think it'd be good if we get our former presidents uh, to get together from time to time and see what they might think collectively would be a good idea about certain things. And their their voice collectively, if we get them all together and agree on something, would probably have some impact and probably be a good idea. Yeah, I like that idea very much. Maybe a special advisory council to each uh, new administration. Um, before we get on to our next book, because we're getting to close to that, a um, couple of questions I have in closing. One, uh, I'm just curious what you view as the happiest time in the lives of the presidents you interviewed. For instance, th these are two that you didn't interview. Lincoln, I thought his time on the circuit was his happiest time in life. And for FDR, I kind of think as assistant secretary of the Navy playing with his boats. Uh, I think he was in his prime position in life. I'm not sure even the presidency, he was happier. What about the ones that you interviewed? Did they indicate where in their lives they really felt content? 
Well, I would say uh, Bill Clinton has been a politically ambitious person for a long time. And so I think when he finally was elected president of the United States, even though at a very young age, he was elected at the age of 46, he was pretty happy. Um, I think today he's pretty happy as well because he's a revered senior statesman and he's you know pretty much admired all over the world. I think George W. Bush is pretty happy now. He's not involved in politics, wants to stay out of public policy, but he's a very happy person. He's got grandchildren. He likes his uh, mountain biking. He likes his painting. He likes hanging out with uh, uh, veterans who've been injured in the war. Um, and so hey, he's a happy person. Uh, I would say Barack Obama, I think, is pretty happy. I don't know exactly, but I think he's pretty happy uh, building his library now in Chicago. Or it's not his library, it's his center. And I think he's pretty happy to kind of have a, a lot of uh, years ahead of him. And he's already been a successful president of the United States. Um, you know, I don't know when you they're know, happy. What I'm hearing, strangely enough, is that most of them are happier after the presidency. I wonder if well, John Quincy that's... Adams was like that. I would bet Carter was. Well, Carter uh, was president for four years, but former president for 44 years. And as a former president, the things he's done is spectacular. Obviously, he won a Nobel Prize for it. John Quincy Adams is the only president who went back into Congress after served as president. And I think he really enjoyed being a member of Congress. He died on the House floor um, after, I think, 12 years of service. William Howard Taft never wanted to be president. And later he got the job he really wanted, being Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. So he was a happy person as well. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, he died uh, very young at 60 years old. I think he was very happy being president. He loved to be the center of attention. And, uh, you know, he was, I think, pretty happy being president. Yeah, interesting. I'm glad to hear that. So I have uh, an artifact I'm going to show that's a good bridge to your next book, uh, which is all about artifacts. Uh, you have uh, Black Hawk, the Black Hawk War was up in our area, north of Chicago and west and southern Wisconsin. And uh, of course, Lincoln was in it swatting flies more than any, and mosquitoes, he said, more than anything else. Um, but I, I have a fairly large collection of the Black Hawk War that uh, I started out with back in the 70s. And one of the things I got was Benjamin Drake's book and uh, just after the Black Hawk War, which was about Black Hawk himself. And this particular copy was actually in the uh, Keokuk family uh, because Keokuk was in here and Drake liked him. Keokuk stayed with uh, the United States where Black Hawk went against them. So this was the Keokuk family. And you have in, the, in your book uh, the, the autobiography that uh, Black Hawk did. So Lincoln said of that time, of all the successes I have had, that is the one that's given me the most pleasure, being elected by his friends and neighbor to something, right. captain in the war. Did any of your presidential interviewers, interviewees, reveal a successful moment in their life that propelled them forward? Well, um, I have to think about who that, who that would, what they would say, but let's say in Barack Obama's case, um, when he won the Senate seat, uh, that propelled him forward. Remember, he had lost two to one in a House seat in Chicago against the incumbent Bobby Rush, and it wasn't thought that he was going anywhere politically. But when he won that Senate seat, all of a sudden he realized his life had changed. He didn't like being a senator, so he figured, I'll run for president. If I lose, okay, but I'll still be a young person. I'll go do something else. So I think he was pretty happy. Uh, and, and, and when he got elected to the Senate, realized he had a lot of potential uh, I think George W. Bush was always trying to prove he was different than his father in many ways, a uh, different kind of person. But he had the burden of having a father be president of the United States, and that's always a challenge for somebody. Uh, Bill Clinton never knew his father. Uh, Bill Clinton, I think, loved politics. And when he got elected to the uh, governorship, that was his really highest uh, achievement. I thought he thought at the time he was elected at the age of 30, but he was defeated for reelection. But then he came back and served another, I think, five terms. So, um, you know, I think when he got first elected, I probably was pretty happy. First elected, actually, to attorney general, then he became governor. Um, I think any of you interested in the presidency, and this is a good year for that, will want to read the highest calling conversations on the American presidency that David Rubenstein did himself. You'll enjoy this book. There's a lot in it to ingest. 
Now let's go to your other passion, and that is historical printed artifacts. This is a book that feeds my soul, and I think anyone, literally anyone, who happens to be in the field of Lincolniana collecting would want this book. I always, you know, I curate these interviews with the books that we feel are the best because I always say it's a must read and buy for this book or that. This is that. You're going to miss out not having this on your shelf. And it's just brilliantly produced with over 300 terrific sumptuous illustrations of printed artifacts that are in the David Rubenstein collection. And I, I'll show these as we go along. I don't know if I can, this is not gonna do justice because it's a hard book for me to show, uh, but, uh, and you're not gonna really see these. We'll show some images from here, but you can see that it's artifact after artifact. It's hard for me to show this uh, well. So let me ask you, why printed artifacts? Why did you hone in on that? Well, let me try to explain. I have a large collection of uh, artifacts, uh, historical documents, uh, ranging from the Magna Carta to the Emancipation Proclamation and so forth. Why should we have these documents? Why should we preserve them? Well, the human brain works in a very mysterious way, as we know. But right now, it treats a historic document differently than it does a computer slide of the same document. In other words, if I tell you I have the original of the Gettysburg Address in my hands and you can come look at it, people are going to want to look at it because they just think they want to see what the original looked like. And before they come, they're probably going to read about it. After they come, they're probably going to read more about it and they'll learn more. But if you just look at it on a computer slide, it's not the same. So the reason I like to preserve these documents and share them with people is because it helps educate people about history. And I think one of the most important things we could do is educate our population more about government and history, because we're now done teaching history very much. Only 2% of college graduates are now majoring in history compared to 8% when I was in college. And we don't teach civics much, very much anymore. As a result, it's very difficult to, to, to get young people to really know much about how our government works. So in, in a modest effort on my part, I try to preserve documents and try to educate people about them and have them come see these documents. All my historic documents are on display somewhere. I own more copies of the Declaration of Independence uh, than anybody in America, including the U.S. government. And I lend my copies to the U.S. government because they don't have as many copies or the kind of copies I have. And that, why did I do that? Well, putting them in my basement isn't going to do me any good. I want people to see the original copies of the Declaration of Independence, learn from it, and get, get inspired by it, and maybe become a better citizen. You know, you're on that macro level. I must say, there are many collectors on the micro level, small collections embedded in small communities that do show their collections so they can learn from you. If you can go to New York and see the exhibit, that will change you very, very drastically. It's just a beautiful piece. Uh, of work. I like what you say in the preface of this book. Your presenting original printings hopefully makes curious those who are historically unconcerned. Right. So the uh, I asked you very briefly before, do you have any plans to travel this collection so more people can see it? Uh, although this book is not a bad way to do it. It's really right. a catalog. I haven't done that yet. The Grawyer Collection uh, exhibition uh, is uh, going to be through, I think, December. So it's there for a while. And then I will uh, take a look at other things. I've been involved with the Smithsonian as a chairman, and I'm the chairman of the Library of Congress board. And uh, University of Chicago, I'm the chair there. And so there are many places I think would be interested in exhibiting this. I do, too. It's interesting. The moment I, I saw what you're doing, I thought about Spencer's book, that you have, and it's in this book as right. well. I'm going to have a copy you know, on my shelf. This was the first bibliography of any of the printed words about Lincoln, really, on the assassination and memorial speeches. So actually, the first leads really to you. And the pamphlets that are in here and the broadsides are fabulous and a huge array of them that you're going to enjoy. It's almost a it's a coffee table book with purpose. And I well, think you thank enjoy you. that. Well, uh, you are a scholar of Lincoln, so I'm glad to, to see and hear that you like it. I hope other people will like it because it's fairly richly illustrated. Oh, my. And, 
And you don't have to read the book and become a Lincoln scholar overnight or take a test on Lincoln. But you should read it and, and enjoy it. Look at the pictures and learn a little bit more about Lincoln than you might already know. Well, there are wonderful historians who write introductions to the various chapters uh, in the book. What is the organization of the book and of your exhibits? The same thing. Well, we take it through various phases of Lincoln's life as a, as a young man, uh, then uh, as a elect, young elected official, then as um, uh, the president of the United States, and then uh, dealing with the Civil War and the aftermath of the Civil War, different parts of Lincoln's life. And so it's it's arranged more or less chronologically. I'm, I'm interested in what your definition or thought is of an artifact. Michelle Crowell and I, right. she's uh, in the Library of Congress, and we're having an ongoing conversation about what should be included in that term. I'm kind of broad broad on that, and I include autographic pieces, letters, documents, the Gettysburg Address. I don't think she would. Um, but to me, these artifacts are important for being, well, what should I say, archaeological footprints of our pre right. uh, predecessors, the material culture of the day. How do you think of an artifact? What is your definition uh, of it? Well, there are many artifacts I don't buy. I don't buy certain souvenirs or buy things that are not intellectually interesting. I tend to buy things that are documents or books or maps or, or pictures so you can get a story, understanding of, of what the person you you're have a collection about is, is doing or was doing. So in Lincoln, we have an extensive collection of, of things he's written, an extensive collection of things he read, extensive collection of, uh, for example, in the, in the collection, we have uh, the, the books that he uh, no doubt had in his library as a young man, not the actual ones in some cases, but but they're, they're similar to the ones he had. And you can learn a lot about Lincoln by you know, looking at this book or by going through the exhibition. And I think Lincoln is somebody we should still admire. Uh, in the previous book we talked about, I had an interview with Ted Widmer about the very interesting trip that Lincoln took from Springfield to Washington, D.C. when he was inaugurated. It was very circuitous because he couldn't go through any Confederate states and he also wanted to introduce himself to most people in the United States who had never seen him before. Very few people knew what he sounded like or looked like. The uh, the captions that are in the book. Now, listen, I, we should give a shout out to Mazi Borogiardi. I hope that's how he pronounces his last name. But Mazi is the editor of this. Did he write the captions? Uh, and what did he think, or you? what do you think that the primary purpose for each of those captions would be? Mozzie is somebody that's worked for me for many years as a uh, helping me collect documents and books. He's a curator, also a savant. He really knows these, these materials extremely well. And this is his life. This is what he cares about. So uh, it was his idea to do the Grawyer exhibition. Um, over the years, we collected these uh, documents. Well, he's really the person who put more time into it than I did. Uh, and then um, he organized the, the, the whole exhibition and so forth. I wrote one of the, uh, the preface, but he helped with the other uh, parts of it. And, uh, you know, I was touring it the other day, and I was just amazed at how, how uh, interesting I think it really is. So anybody that cares about Lincoln, cares about American history, I think will find it to be quite interesting uh, to go there and see it. Well, you may not be able to go there and see it. I'm talking to the viewers now. This book will put you there. And they it's just illustrated, as I keep saying sumptuously, it is. You're going to love these these illustrations are going to pop out and the captions will give you some information. You can't do everything with them, but I think Mazi did a great job. You one one of the areas is Lincoln reading. And if you show Shakespeare, that was Blackhawk, but Bjorn, if you'll show the Shakespeare book. Uh, right. That's something that he started out with. But it was interesting because you also show Plutarch. And that shows something I, that what you said, how you can uh, actually learn about Lincoln just from an artifact. Here is Plutarch's lives right here. And you have a copy of that, although he hadn't read it when the first biography by John Locke Scripps came out or 1860 campaign. But here's an interesting thing about Lincoln and why Plutarch is there. Scripps said that he read Plutarch in his biography. And Lincoln thought that's not really true. And he didn't want Scripps to be 
expanding on himself or lying even. So he went out and found Plutarch and read it so that the already printed scripts biography would be true. That's a good way to learn from this book about the inner Lincoln. Look, Lincoln is somebody that people should know more about because he was, as I've said earlier, the, our greatest president and a person who really did incredible things to help this country stay together. Um, I'd love to show some of the things that are in here. Um, the introductions, uh, I think, are wonderful. Who were some of the historians that you had? Harold well, Holzer, uh, a friend of yours, is one. Harold Holzer has written more than 50 books on, on Lincoln. And I think on, on November 22nd, I'll have an event at Grier Club where he will interview me, though I, I really should be interviewing him about it. Um, so there are a lot of very good uh, scholars that are in there. Uh, I think Ted Widmer as well. Um, and, uh, you know, the good, good cross section of Lincoln scholars. Um, Robert Gray, who was in here, uh, he had on the reading aspect uh, for Lincoln. Robert ends up, and I'd like to read this and have you maybe comment on this. In this connection, from a literary standpoint, we can note that Lincoln's singularity in American history goes beyond his astounding accomplishments as president, but also to what he shares with the country's origins of being born, self-actualized really, from the written word. Just as the United States exists because of the founding documents it created, so too did Lincoln create himself through reading. Without reading, without books, Lincoln never would have escaped poverty, never would have become a lawyer, and never would have become president so deeply committed to the enlightened conception of America. Yes, Lincoln was loved to read, and as you know, he would sometimes, as a youth, walk several miles to be able to get a book so he could read the book. Um, it uh, wasn't so easy to just call Amazon in those days and get the book delivered to you or go to the Lincoln bookstore and, and, and bookshop and get it. So he, he would walk miles to get books, and he learned a lot uh, uh, about the early history of the country, and he idealized um, idolized the, the founders of our country, he really thought that Jefferson – and and Washington were heroes to him, and he he admired them. And that's one of the reasons why he didn't want to change the Constitution uh, as it was written relating to slavery, because he wanted to keep it the way the founding fathers had created it. You have a chapter on many things. One of the chapters on elections, and you have uh, a page of election ballots. Uh, and as Jonathan Earle, in his introduction to the Lincoln, the candidate, points out that Lincoln himself had to be prodded into actually voting. But here, Bjorn, if you can show the sample election ballots from your collection, how did electing take place, ele the election take place and voting take place in Lincoln's time with these ballots? Well, they didn't have absentee balloting in those days. You had to show up on the polling day and you would get a piece of paper and you write on the paper your, who you supported. And that's typically how it worked. Um, so um, it was a very um, different process than we have today. And the counting of the ballots was in many ways simpler than it is today. Um, but I would say that uh, people took uh, great faith in the accuracy of the counting. People didn't challenge the votes so much. They, there were some challenges for sure. But generally, uh, it was a very uh, antiquated system compared to what we have today. I'm only going to show you half of this because it actually goes out the other side. Hold back a little bit here. And Bjorn, if you could put up this page, the whole thing. This is a great fold out of campaign biographies. Look at this. You're, you're not going to ever get this close right. to so many all at once. Yeah, let me and, explain what that's about. Please. Um, candidates in those days did not campaign for themselves. It was considered unprofessional and unseemly to go out and campaign for yourself. So how did you get the word out if you couldn't go out and make speeches yourself? Well, one of the ways was, of course, you had other people speaking for you, but a very common way was to have people write auto, uh, write biographies of you, and those biographies would be distributed. And some of those biographies written by people uh, were very, very impressive. So, for example, Franklin Pierce had a, a young writer write a biography of him, and it was so great that he got elected president, even though he wasn't that well-known. The biography was written by a man named Nathaniel Hawthorne. 
So if you can get somebody like Nathaniel Hawthorne to write a biography about you, you might have a good chance of being elected president, and it worked. Lincoln had a lot of good people writing book bi biographies about him, and obviously it propelled him forward. Um, one, I want to show one of those pieces, uh, Bjorn, if you'll show the Ichabod Cotting pamphlet. This is one that was suppressed. Uh, the Republicans thought this is not a good look because Cotting was an abolitionist. This is in 1860, and they went around Illinois and suppressed it and burned, I suppose, as many copies as they could get. Uh, but this is probably one of the more important, to me, pieces that you have, uh, because being an abolitionist, it put Lincoln, he, he, was, he had a brief biography in that pamphlet, and uh, the Republicans were worried that the, uh, the people, the voters would put Lincoln, and connect them with the abolitionists. The right. abolitionists in the West were a little more flexible than those in the East. And they were ready to go with Lincoln, even though he wasn't in all of them, with them entirely. He was too slow for them. But his heart, his heart was in the right place. And that's what Cotting thought. And that's why in this, this booklet, he tries to tell the abolitionists, vote for Lincoln. His heart is in the right place. Yes, uh, Lincoln was not an abolitionist, as we all know. Um, he was importuned to be more uh, willing to free the slaves early on his, in his presidency. He did chose not to do so. And ultimately, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation as a war measure, in part to kind of weaken the South because they wouldn't have the labor of the slaves if the slaves were freed and, and escaped. And also some of those soldiers, some of those freed slaves would become soldiers in the North. And about 200,000 uh, did so. So Lincoln uh, displeased the abolitionists by not being more in favor of uh, getting rid of slavery right away. Uh, ultimately, Lincoln came around to that view, though. At the end of the book, you you come to the 20, 20th, 21st century, I should say, right. with these folders, with numerous books that are today uh, dealing with Lincoln. When I thought about you, David, and, and what you collect, you kind of collect uh, the Bible, the originalism, right. artifacts of the time. Whereas these books show, I think, kind of the Talmud, if I can say that, the interpretive history that followed his life. There's a connectedness to this, is there not? Correct. I mean, obviously, the people write these books and the scholars, they go through the original documents and, and look at them. Um, it is said that there are more books written about Lincoln than any other American. I think that's no doubt true. It may be more than any other human who's not thought to be a religious figure. So uh, Lincoln, yeah. uh, you would know better than I. Is it 10,000 or 20,000 books have been written about him? You know, I keep hearing 16, 17, 18,000 in that area. Uh, okay. I've never sat and counted, but uh, probably somewhere in that area. And it is uh, amazing that even when new books come out on Lincoln, people still have an appetite for them. Yes, uh, when do. Doris, Doris Kearns Goodwin came out with her book, Team of Rivals, everybody had already read books about Lincoln, but he had a new uh, twist on it, and it turned out to be a great book and ultimately a great movie uh, about Lincoln. Um, I'd say John Meacham came out with a book not long ago on Lincoln. It met a new audience, and you know you can't satiate the demand for books about Lincoln. It's very interesting, uh, that. Of course, that's one of the reasons there's an Abraham Lincoln bookshop and not a, Fillmore, a Millard Fillmore bookshop. Uh, because there still is an appetite for him. One of the things that I found, though, was that today more readers are reading what's coming out, which is nice. It supports authors, uh, supports a shop. But at the same time, I think some of the classic works are being left behind. And uh, I mourn that. Some of those that should be read, Alan Nevins, as an example, uh, he should be read more today and really is not. So uh, I hope that uh, new, the newer readers today, the younger readers will go back into the classics as well as those two pages that you just said. Yes. Um, there's an obsession with uh, STEM education these days. And many people feel if you don't have a STEM degree from a college, you can't get a job at Goldman Sachs or Google. But the truth is many of the people that lead Wall Street companies and even technology companies are not always engineers or STEM majors. And so I encourage people to have a better background than just technology and reading history and learning about history is a good way to advance in life.
True. Uh, Bjorn, would you show us a few images that are from the book that you have? For instance, the National Police Gazette. There's, you know, that's how people learned. They, they couldn't go <laughs> to uh, YouTube to see what was going on or anywhere else or C-SPAN. They had to go to the National Police Gazette, Harper's Weekly, Leslie's. So here was one during the time of the, after the, uh, his murder, and those are the conspirators that are being hanged down in the lower right corner, as you can see. Those are the ones that did. This was done up very quickly afterward. Uh, the next one would be a pamphlet that came out. People were satiated, wanted to be satiated. Reading here is one on Mary Surratt uh, and the trial that was that took place. Of course, she was hanged. Some didn't want her to because of her sex and her age, but there's what it was. There are other uh, women that are shown here, and Frank Moore and Women of the War. I think you have one there, Bjorn, that shows a woman who who actually fought as a man, and that's part of your book and part of your exhibit yes. as well. Um, I don't know if we That's can correct. show that. But, uh, and one I also love very much is a toy that uh, was shown, uh, the metamorphosis toy that shows Lincoln and Jeff Davis in a fight. Uh, a, that actually is a strange thing that was done after Bull Run, but because Jeff Davis is hitting Lincoln in the nose uh, and bloodying him. Right. But it was done years later and uh, but it's a beautiful piece. And uh, if you can put that up, Bjorn, you can see the types of things that are here because this is an important book. You're going to want to see it. Here is the latest news. These are the types of things you're going to see that you don't always see in books. Here as well, you're going to see a Lincoln Douglas debate signed. Here is the Charleston Mercury, which is a wonderful collectible and people really want to get. Uh, so what can I say, David, I think you have two wonderful books. The exhibit is really spectacular. And if anyone wants Thank to you. Li live that experience, here's a wide awake vocalist. There are numbers of, uh, vocal, uh, uh, the clubs that use these songsters in the campaign. Uh, they put new words to old tunes that they all could, could do that would, uh, talk about their candidate or against the other candidate. So I think this is a special book. It's a special catalog. And there's not much like this out here. And you've put it out on your table. Not only are you going to be obsessed with it, like uh, like this uh, obsequies, but so will your kids and the youth. They're image-oriented. Here's the 13th Amendment. That is in the can. And it'd be nice to see it up close in beautiful color in your book, David. So well, thank you very much. We want to thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure. And we ask all of you to go to our website. You can get now signed books with, with, uh, we're not in the same room. Uh, so we're going to have to get you our special printed book plates that David has been kind enough to sign. And those will be coming with each of these two books that are well worth having. Thank you again, David, very much. All right, my pleasure. Thanks a lot, very much.